Hello everybody, welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host, and today I'm going to talk to you about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think this is a singular event which will not only impact global order, but will also impact global economy. Uh, I could not speak to you about this particular event earlier because I was traveling in Argentina where I was serving as a U.S. chair talking about American foreign policy and lecturing about U.S. foreign policy in Argentina. But now that I am back, this is the first thing that I really want to talk to you about. I have with me 10 ideas, 10 points, and I think every capital in the world, every international organization, uh, every individual should ponder about it. Number one is very simple, that we live in a world which is militarily very sophisticated. We have technology which can devastate societies. So it is very important that war become the last option. We need to work with more vigor and more endeavors to ensure that war is never an option. There is no winners coming out of wars. And I understand, as an American, that we have waged more unnecessary wars worldwide uh, to advance our so-called interests or to continue to maintain our global hegemony. But this message is to my fellow Americans too. It is very important that all of us try to do our best to ensure that there is no war because it caused such high levels of devastation that it is inhuman, uncivilized, and immoral to consider even just wars. My number two point is that even though the West has not militarily responded to Russia, the economic warfare that we have unleashed against Russia uh, in response to its aggression is going to have devastating impact on not just Russia, but also on Europe and ultimately on America. These sanctions, these sanctions are going to hurt everyone they're going to have a very similar impact uh, like COVID did to the global economy. Trade is going to be disrupted. Countries are going to become very suspicious about international order and international institutions. Today, nobody had thought until now that SWIFT could become weaponized. And the weaponization of SWIFT must be compelling people in other countries to think about how they could also become targets uh, of economic warfare. And so I think the trust in international institutions worldwide might diminish. Of course, those who are cheering for Ukraine and would love to punish Russia, they see this as a positive development. But overall, I think uh, it is going to cause an increased distrust in international institutions and international organizations. Number three, for a while now, experts in international relations were arguing that we are moving away from the international liberal order established uh, after World War II towards a renewed uh, uh, global geopolitics uh, and great power rivalry, and this is on the show. Russia, in pursuit of its security, has essentially uh, launched a preemptive war on Ukraine to prevent it from joining NATO. Uh, and this, the logic for it is can only be understood in terms of great power rivalry. So basically, we have, speaking in terms of time, we have traveled into the past. We now live in a world before 1945, where we will see increased geopolitics, state-centric politics, and tensions between great powers, even more than we have seen in the past few decades. But before I move to point four, I want you to do a small thing. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. Number four, Russia through its aggressive actions is justifying the fears of Eastern European nations in driving them towards the West. Countries like Ukraine and Georgia are frightened of Russia and so are Sweden and Finland, and they would all want to join NATO. So if the provocation for the war was Ukraine's desire to join NATO, what Russia's aggression has done is at least convinced Europeans that uh, Ukraine's move was legitimate, its fears were legitimate. But Russia also needs to rethink this fear of NATO. There are countries in NATO, like Turkey and Hungary, for example, who seem to be more friendly with Russia than the West. 
So Russia still has appeal and influence in Eastern NATO countries. So Russia needs to moderate its fear of NATO. I understand that expansion of NATO means American missiles on Russian borders, uh, and that has been expedited by uh, U.S. Uh, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and U.S. has now moved troops into many NATO nations, uh, all targeting Russia. So Russia needs to think that perhaps NATO is not as big a threat as it imagines. It has also backfired in one spectacular way, and this is my number five. Germany is changing its defense and security policies. It's spending, it has announced that it's going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars more on defense. While this might help the US and NATO become more powerful, but it also says that there will be another major power in Europe soon uh, that can challenge and oppose Russia in Eurasia and also empower and strengthen uh, the West and particularly U.S. because of its alliance with the U.S. through NATO. My point number six is NATO has to ask itself a serious question. First of all, why does it exist after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Not only does NATO continue to exist in the absence of an existential threat, thereby simply exaggerating Russia, a $1.4 trillion economy that is smaller than Texas and Italy, as a giant threat to European security. In order to exist and justify its existence, NATO demonizes Russia, and it has been expanding, thereby creating a security dilemma for Russia. So NATO needs to ask itself this serious question as to why it continues to exist. And this war clearly says that NATO's existence has not made Europe safer. In fact, NATO's expansion has brought war to Europe after so many decades. My seventh point is for Americans. We were just celebrating the end of forever wars. If Americans truly want to end these forever wars, then why are we so bent upon expanding NATO? Its expansion shows that we are not being defensive, but we are being offensive and trying to dominate Europe. The United States seeks to dominate Europe through NATO. Yes, it benefits NATO, it benefits European countries, but in order to do that, in order to justify the existence of NATO, we are unnecessarily creating tensions with countries like Russia. At some point, even China is going to be worried about the eastern expansion of NATO. Right now, Russia is like a buffer state, but a very, very weak Russia is not going to be a strong buffer for China. So Americans also need to ask this question about NATO. Are we using NATO as a provocation? Or is it a way for us to keep our European allies in line with us? And now, before I go to the next point, make sure that you have subscribed to the channel. My point number eight is, it's quite interesting to hear President Putin of Russia talk about Ukraine as if it's a fake nation, that it does not exist, it is a made-up country. It kind of reminded me about Saddam Hussein's conversations and statements about Kuwait. He too declared that Kuwait was a fake nation artificially created by colonial powers. It had no right to exist and therefore his invasion was justified because he was merely integrating uh, uh, Kuwait into Iraq. Putin's idea that Ukraine is an integral part uh, of Russia and that there are familial ties and they are the same people, then how could you unleash a war upon yourself? If Ukraine is part of Russia, then Russia has declared a war on itself. And I think this is worth pondering that in order to keep what you think is yours, you are destroying it. My point number nine is that along with the mighty display of unity that Western countries have managed to produce and the economic cloud that is clearly evidence, which has led to economic isolation of Russia, 
there is also an element of Western hypocrisy which is on display. We continue to see Western countries punishing Russia for doing exactly what the United States did in 2003 when it invaded Iraq. The US too said lies about Iraq and invaded and devastated that country, killed literally hundreds of thousands of people, displaced millions, created refugees. Iraq hasn't yet recovered. It's nearly two decades since that war got over. There were no sanctions against the US. These same European countries did not stand up on any principle. There were no uh, threats to remove the, the US from SWIFT. Obviously, it is because the US has so much power. So, so this standing on principle bit is a bit shallow. And so I think it is important for Western countries to reduce their moral rhetoric and talk in more realistic and political terms about how to deal with Russia, because if these sanctions, etc., last for a long time, then it's not just Russia that is going to suffer, but it's also going to be Europeans and also Americans who are going to suffer. And I'm pretty sure that in November, President Biden will have to face the judgment of American people. They're not only going to judge him on his domestic politics, but they're also going to judge him uh, on the way he has handled this particular crisis. And at that time, when we have moved away from the, from the immediacy of the violence and the horrible things that are happening to the poor Ukrainian people, American citizens are going to ask the question, the insistence of Biden not to demand neutrality from Ukraine, was that one of the reasons why uh, uh, Putin felt that he was boxed and had no option but to attack Ukraine? We will have this quest conversation, mind you, and we will have it with greater intensity as we get closer, closer and closer to the November elections. My final point is about Asia's nuclear powers. There are three nuclear powers in Asia, India, China, and Pakistan, and none of them has condemned Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. So if people here in America are thinking that the entire world is with uh, Ukraine and the, world, and the West, yes, the public opinion and sentiments are with the Ukrainian people. However, these countries, China, India, and Pakistan, are definitely not abandoning and isolating Russia. Putin's visit to India just before this war began, one of the most important things that was discussed was ruble-rupee trade. By passing uh, uh, the dollars and also escaping uh, sanctions that the West is imposing on Russia. So it is quite possible that this particular response of Europe might create alternative international structures of trade. It will. It will, it will definitely hurt globalization, but it may also create alternative measures, institutions, protocols of international trade, thereby weakening uh, American and European domination of international trade. And that is an interesting development. The point that I'm trying to make is that, yes, uh, countries like Singapore and, uh, and Switzerland have also condemned Russia and have participated in, in sanctioning Russia. But there is a big chunk of the world which is not very happy with the isolation of Russia because they have a lot in stake. And eventually, as this conflict protracts, uh, I anticipate uh, fractures uh, in, inside the European Union uh, over this issue. So overall, it's going to be bad for the world. It is. It's as if like the COVID has not ended. We should consider this as a new variant of COVID, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, because it is going to have uh, very similar uh, ramifications for global order and for the global economy. This is Muqtadar Khan. These are my thoughts. Uh, if you like them, do share them with your friends. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel, like the video, and do everything. Uh, that you have to do as a good friend of conversations. Thank you very much.